Greetings, this is Tom Lonberg, the Chief Curator and Curator of History at the Evansville Museum of Arts, History and Science in Evansville, Indiana. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our most recent episode of Tipsy Topics with Tori and Tom, where we explore a lot of fun things and we have a really unique and exciting episode in store for you today. But before that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our two newest exhibitions at the Evansville Museum. We really have a fun exhibit, Expert Tattooing in the Midwest. Yeah, tattoos, come learn about tattooing. It's a really fascinating history. And to add to that, the collectors and curators, Clint and Heather Vaught, are kindly coming out every Saturday through August 21st through the run of the exhibit from one to two to give guided tours of the exhibit. So you can learn all about tattooing. So certainly invite you to come down and be part of that. Our another new exhibit is Votes for Women, Justice Delayed, which is our one year delay due to COVID exhibition looking at the centennial plus one of women getting the right to vote in our country. That is a passage of the 19th Amendment. We'll have lots of programs going along with that. The first one is from a professor from Ball State University, Melissa Gentry, will be talking about the suffrage movement in Indiana on Sunday, June the 13th at 2 p.m. You can visit on Facebook to learn more about this or at our website at emuseum.org. Now it's time to get to the good part. That is away from seeing me and hearing from me. And the first part of that good part is the Virginia G. Schrader, curator of art, Tori Schindel Cox. And Tori's wonderful. She has a wonderful guest for us this, this day. And we're gonna be talking about a small but mighty topic today. And Tori, to get us going, I gladly turn it over to your capable hands. Well, Tom, I really appreciate it. And like I said, uh, every single episode, I love your introduction. The only thing that I'm jealous of about you is that you have more beautiful hair than I do. But on a side note. Well, let's, let's be full disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> this is just to keep the reflection off the screen. So no one's getting glare in their eyes while we're recording. It's That's my okay. very poor man's toupee. <laughs> Well, as the curator of art, I do appreciate it. And we also appreciate the fact that we have Dr. Stephanie Carter. Doctor, and I, doctor, doctor. And you'll understand here in a short second, we read her bio of why this is such an amazing title that she has earned and deserves to be called. So Dr. Stephanie L. Carter is a Scottish material culture specialist, curator, and anthropologist. Originally growing up in Central Florida, from a young age, she was fascinated with cultures around the world. Her love for Scottish culture started in the most unlikely of places, her high school band. Her school's band is well known for their Scottish bagpipers and dancers. She played the bagpipes for three years and began a journey of fascination with the culture they represent. Once she learned the term anthropology, she followed her childhood passion of cultures to gain her bachelor's degree in anthropology from the University of South Florida. Following yet another dream, that of Scotland, she then enrolled in the Scottish and Irish Studies postgraduate program at the University of Aberdeen in Aberdeen, Scotland. Her first official role as a museum curator was for her hometown's local history museum. She wanted to gain the knowledge to go with the practical experiences and enrolled in Johns Hopkins University's Museum Studies program, Blue Jays, gaining her master's degree in 2012. For a short time, she pursued a passion for the conservation of museum objects, but decided to pull all her previous knowledge together to form a proposal for PhD research. Her focus was on Scottish material culture, specifically as seen through the lens of a Lewis Chessman and the value we place onto objects. After nine androgynous years, Dr. Carter received her degree in Scottish and something in two 2021 from the University of Edinburgh. And we are so excited and delighted that she's here to share a small portion of her research because uh, be on the lookout, that book will come. And <laughs> we're so excited to learn more about this. So Stephanie, thank you so much for taking this time. And Dr. Carter, I'm gonna pass it on to you. Uh, you can call me Stephanie, honestly, just uh, I appreciate you indulging me. It's obviously still pretty new to me. So I get a little thrill every time I hear it. So. Thanks for that. Um, and thanks uh, to both you, uh, Tori and Tom, for having me. I'm pretty excited. This is the first time I've been able to present some of my research now that it's finally over. 
Um, so just a quick a little bit of information. As you see, I'm going to be talking to you today about the Lewis Chessman. Um, I'm only going to be talking to you about one specific chapter from my thesis because let's be honest, it's so long. Nobody wants to hear all of it. Um, so I didn't really start out originally actually doing the Lewis Chessman. Um, it kind of was a, a meandering way that I got there. As most, as most, most PhDs, you start in one place and you end up in another nine years later. So um, my study originally was going to be, I did want to research how people connect to objects in various ways. Um, and that's kind of, but my lens specifically was from the people of Scotland, from their culture, how they connect to objects. Um, I wanted to kind of utilize all my backgrounds. I have the anthropology and the Scottish cultural studies and my love of objects. Um, so then I just kind of mashed them all together and created something. Um, and generally when I say objects, I'm going to talk generally about those that you find in a museum or things sort of dug up from the ground, you know, really any objects, to be honest, because everyday items are just as important sometimes. Um, so I wanted just to give a little bit of context to my, we're going to say specialization um, for the study of material culture. So the, the field itself is based in anthropology, um, but it also draws from other social sciences and humanities including museum studies um, and humans, you know, we're special creatures. We're the only species who actually make and use objects. And, you know, we've been doing this for millennia, which can be um, demonstrated through um, objects that we found that are over 3 million years old that humans made and used. Um, and as humans, because we create and make these objects, we also place values onto them. And these values can all be different based on our backgrounds, our history, our culture, our religious beliefs, um, family structures, all kinds of politics, anything you can think of. One object is going to mean something completely different to somebody else based off their background. Um, and, you know, just at the end of the day, they're just in, inanimate things that don't really do anything, but we make them live and breathe through the values that we put on them. Um, so kind of with that little bit of context in place, I'm going to speak to you about my chess pieces here. I say my because they've been mine for nine years, so they're mine. Um, and I'd just like you to keep in mind that throughout the course of the PhD, I would be I'd be asked by people, you know, what are you studying? Being a being a, an American in Scotland, my voice gave me away that I was not of the country. Um, a lot of people would ask me, so what are you doing? What are you studying? And I would always say, you know, the Lewis Chessman. Um, and usually it was a blank stare, just blank. Most people I talk to have never heard of them before. Um, so I'm going to give you a little to start off before we get to sort of the meat of the program here, I'm gonna give you a brief background on the chessmen, just to give you a bit of context um, about them before we kind of really get into it. So Tori, if you could just go on to the next slide for me, please. And so this is just a brief bit of information about where they may have been found. As you find out as I go through this, may have is a great phrase to use for the chessmen. Um, so what we know so far is that they were found on the island of Lewis. It is an island to the west of Scotland in what is a collection of islands known as the Outer Hebrides. So Lewis is a primary, uh, primarily Gaelic-speaking country. I say country, island, they're still part of Scotland. Sometimes they don't act like they want to be. Um, but most people over there grow up as English as their second language. Um, so it is pretty accepted in scholarly circles that the chessmen were uncovered in 1831. That's where the, we're going to say certainty kind of ends. Um, so if you could hit enter for me a couple times, we'll put all the rest up on the screen there. Um, so for most, most scholars believe that the chessmen were found in um, an area called Ardroil, Ardroil, I can't say it, it's, it's Gaelic, Ardroil, we're just going to go with that beach, which is usually known as Uig, and Uig is a bay, as you can see there on the screen, um, and Uig is a Scandinavian term for bay. Um, so you will find all over Scotland, especially in sort of Lewis and the Hebrides, lots of Scandinavian influences. Um, I say Scandinavian, I want to say Viking, but we're just going to, we're going to say Scandinavian. So um, 
As a point of interest, uh, the people of Uig, which is where most people think they were found, they don't call them the Lewis Chessmen, they call them Uig Chessmen because they're, they're ours, they belong to us. And they were ours, they're not Lewis, they're ours. <laughs> um, so just, just a bit of interesting little fact there. Um, but in 2010, um, in his book on the Chessmen, former curator at the National Museum of Scotland, David, Dr. David Caldwell, who used to be there, they call them the, the keeper. I like that term a little bit better than curator personally, but he was their keeper at the British, or excuse me, at the National Museum of Scotland. Um, in his book, he proposed that the Chessmen may have actually been found a little bit further south. Um, to the location that's read on the screen as well. And it's actually considered to be the site of an ancient nunnery um, historically. So as I said, we know it's 1831, but then we don't know. We're just gonna, if one of those two sites, we're gonna think that that's where they're found. Um, so if you can go to the next slide for me. So a little bit more insight here. Um, if you wanna go ahead and hit enter, we might as well see it all on the screen. So there's a reason why there's a picture of the cow on your screen as well. So we have, as, as previously noted, we also have conflicting discoverers who found the chessmen. So uh, some sources say, say that it was a farmer, his name is Malcolm McLeod, um, and he lived quite near Uig, right there at the, the mouth of the bay. And I actually, when I was in Scotland, well, I lived there for six years, but when I was in Lewis, um, some local people took me to where his farm is so that I could see kind of where he was in comparison to the rest of the bay. Um, so apparently he found the pieces in a um, sand dune one day. Um, another story, however, notates that his cow was digging around with his horns and uncovered the chessmen. And then we have another story that is a combination of the both. So somehow they both found them. Um, so we really don't have a conclusive answer for that. Um, and even with, we don't know who really discovered it, we now have, we don't really know where they were found physically. So we have that it could have been in a sand bank that he dug up, Mr. McLeod. Um, it could have been in an underground chamber. I've, I've read some research that they, it was this sort of underground crazy chamber that they were buried in. Hmm. There's then the cow's horn that we talked about. Some people think the weather may have uncovered them, that the sands moved away, and then kind of a combination of anything because again, we don't really know. Um, in the photo, you'll see his, his cow. I just thought that was pretty funny. I found that painting and just made me laugh. But the photo below is a personal photograph I took, and it is a large wooden chess piece that is at the site of kind of where you go into the beach at the bay. So they have a little marker there that says, these, this is where the chessmen were found. Um, all right, so if you want to go on to the next screen. Stephanie, if I, could, if I could just very briefly add for our Evansville listeners, yeah. Dr. James McLeod is a well-known person in Evansville and a native of Scotland. We confirmed with him this morning. He is not related to Malcolm McLeod. That would be a fun, fun connection to be like, my ancestor found Scotland's greatest archaeological Absolutely. collection. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> uh, <I'll think> <laughs> so yet again, we have more conflicting info coming your way. Uh, if you want to just kind of hit enter about four times and kind of stop there. Um, so more questions that we have that we need to answer, you know, where were they made? Who were they made for? When were they made? And how did they get to Lewis? Um, and so up until recently, this pretty much where they were made, um, well, I, I'll just kind of actually just go ahead and hit enter a few more times because we'll just, just do four more times to enter. That just, just might as well put it up there as we say more conflicting information. Um, and I was going to say up until recently, there wasn't really a discussion too much about where they think the chessmen were made. Um, for the most part, scholars believed that they originated somewhere in Scandinavia. They've kind of pinpointed, they think Norway, specifically Trondheim, as it was a center of ivory carvings and such. So they think that's possibly where they were made, question mark. Um, if you want to hit enter, 
Um, up until recently, there is um, an American scholar named Nancy Marie Brown, as well as an Icelandic, uh, Icelandic scholars who've now proposed the idea that the chessmen may have been made by a woman in Iceland who was a master carver. Mm. Question mark, we don't know. So who were they for? Um, who were they made for is, is another subject that scholars have attempted to answer. One very popular theory is that they were probably made for either royalty or high ranking church officials. Um, let's be honest, these intricately carved things that took people a long time, money, resources to make, um, weren't gonna probably be for your, your average kind of person. So it's, it's kind of implied that they were probably for higher ranking people of society. When were they made? Oh, this is the question that if scholars are going to talk about the chessmen, this is the one they're going to argue about. They debate about it a lot. Um, and I have so many dates I found through all my research, and they it's mind boggling. Um, they go back and forth trying to be more and more precise with their dating. Some say the pieces were created as early as the 11th century. Um, while many others are in the 12th century camp, that's the pretty solid one where you've got a lot of people kind of camping out at that 12th century. Then you have some other people that are saying maybe the 13th century. So again, it's questionable. Um, and lastly, how did they get to Lewis? Also is a, at best an educated guess. Scholars have just kind of hoped that they may have answered it. I'm, I'm not trying to dissuade their research because obviously people have done a lot of amazing things but there's no definitive answer. That's kind of the point of showing this. Um, they believe that the pieces could have been um, kind of on a route from Norway to a large trading town, possibly like Dublin and possibly the ship carrying them was wrecked on the island, maybe during a storm at some point. Um, and then someone on, on board may have taken the pieces and buried them on at the beach somewhere, maybe for safekeeping. Um, however, the local legends, which I like more because you can't discount local legend and lore, I believe. Um, you know, we have the, the age of science, but you can't, you can't give up people's local history. They have more colorful explanations of how the chessmen got to be where they were, um, included things like they were stolen off the boat, there was cattle raids involved, murderers, hangings, warring clans, all the good stuff. Um, but if you hit, um, you know, the, the point of bringing all this conflicting information forward is to make a point that basically as I conducted my research, I made my own hypothesis. As much as we think we know about the Lewis Chessman, can you put enter please? <laughs> <laughs> we have no idea. There's no definitive answers. I've even read a text where it was debated that maybe they weren't found in 1831 and that's sort of the only thing heard consistently was that then I read another and they're like we heard rumor they were sitting on the island for this many years so they have no idea to be honest um they're a bit of a, a mystery so the reason for this the pieces are unique nothing else has ever been found like them there's nothing to compare them to to answer these questions um so I believe that this in itself is one of the the greatest uh, values they possess that we don't know because they're so unique so if you want to pop to the next slide. So, so how many pieces were found or are, oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting to that one. So, how timely now, are you? Yeah. Now when I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a little thing I'm kind of looking at for notes as well, but I'm just pay attention to the fact that I'm gonna say something a different number here. So I have an 1831 total of 93 pieces were found, which is accurate. Um, so you'll see on my screen, it says 94, and there is a reason for that. Um, so at the time, this included 59 face pieces. That's, that's your queens, kings, bishops, knights. There's a collection that's called, uh, they're called warders, which you would probably think of as a rook. Um, and there are four special warders in this collection called berserkers. Um, and in a traditional chess set, you've got 32, pe two, 32 pieces for the entire board. And that includes two kings, two queens, four bishops, four knights, four warriors, and 16 pawns. So if you kind of look at the numbers, scholars have theorized and of course debated 
that based on the numbers of phase pieces found, the Lewis cord could almost constitute four complete sets. Um, so there are several phase pieces and pawns that are missing. If you want to hit enter a couple more times, maybe three more times. There we go. So there are a few that are missing. Actually, if you want to hit it another couple times, I've got another little box that will come up, which will show what we're missing. And two, three, there we go. So that's what we're missing to make four complete sets. Um, now, since their original find date, nothing else has ever been found relating to them. I've said from day one, this was probably my own silly kind of wishful thinking. I was like, they're on somebody's mantle somewhere. They're just, they're chalking them away. They've got them somewhere <laughs> hidden. They're, just, they're, they're somewhere. And wouldn't you know that as I'm wrapping up my, well, wrapping up in 2018, sort of, um, sorry, 19, 2019, kind of out of the blue, we get this article coming out. And of course, I just couldn't understand how I was doing my thesis on this and this came about, but an unprecedented find was discovered in someone's drawer in a home in Edinburgh. And one of the missing warders uh, from the collection had been found. Um, now, again, nothing else has ever been found from the original find date, and no archaeological digs were ever done in the area. So I think that's kind of interesting. Um, so this, um, this missing piece had been in someone's um, desk drawer since the 1950s when their family member purchased it for five pounds at an antique shop. And with this new discovery, this now brings the number of pieces up to 94. So that was my correction there. Included in the hoard, you know, in addition to the face pieces, we have 19 pawns. And as you'll see soon, the pawns are pretty plain compared to the face pieces. We've got 14 very plain discs, which we believe might have been for another game. And then we have a belt buckle. So if you want to hit enter, we're gonna see some pretty pictures. So here is a, an example of each one of the face pieces. So you've got your king, your queen, your bishop, you've got your knight, there is your warder and my screen. Let me move things around so I can see what I'm looking at here. Oh, and there's your berserker on the end. Um, now you see the pawn down in the sort of left bottom corner. It's kind of plain and that's actually one that's decorative compared to the rest of the plain ones. And then the belt buckle and the plain sort of discs. Um, so these photos are, are not mine. They, they come from both the British Museum and the National Museum of Scotland. Um, and as you can see in the second to last photo at the top, that is the newly, newly discovered warder that was found in 2019. So now you can see a little picture of that one. Um, now, just to give a little chess background, I am not a chess expert at all. Um, I don't even know how to play, so <laughs> don't judge me. But scholars believe that chess uh, began in India, spread to Persia, and into Islamic and Byzantine areas through the centuries. Through the Lewis collection, we can see the move of chess into Europe through the introduction of the queen. She takes her place beside the king as his advisor and confidant, um, ousting Eastern representations of an all male centric board, um, including the king's advisor, the vizier. We can also see the rise in Christianity through the Lewis collection, as well through the inclusion of the bishop, a piece not found in older sets. Um, now, as I was saying, there are four unique warders uh, found in Lewis Horde, which have been dubbed the moniker Berserker. And you see the guy on the far end there. Um, that's the last face piece. That's a Berserker. Um, he's the mascot of my presentation because he's my favorite. So I put him everywhere. Um, as you can see, the piece has bulging eyes and he's chomping eagerly at his sword, ready to face battle. These figures hearken to their Scandinavian namesakes, berserkers. These warriors would have been in what we think to be a traditional Viking army. Um, they fought in almost like trance, crazed, frenzy kind of state. Um, and the historic figure, that title berserker, has gone on to be our part of our modern vocabulary of to, to be berserk, to go out of control. 
Um, so we can kind of see both in one collection, the rise of Christianity, but then we've got this inclusion of this pagan past all in one place. Um, and it cre creates such an interesting juxtaposition that has been found, it's not been found anywhere else in any other gaming set. Um, so again, the pawn at the bottom, kind of plain, like I said, that was one of, one of the more decorative pawns that I found a picture of to put up. Um, it's very, very lackluster compared to all the carvings above. Um, but then if you look in the middle of that ivory belt buckle, that's, that's pretty, pretty well carved. It's pretty beautiful there. Um, random thing to find in this collection, but we think, I say we, they, I'm not, I didn't just say this, but scholars believe that that belt buckle may have possibly been a closure for some kind of bag that may have held the collection. And then obviously if it's some kind of organic material, it's gonna deteriorate, deteriorate over time. So that is the only recollection or understanding we have for the belt buckle being included. And then the, as I said, with the discs, we don't really know, possibly part of another gaming set that just kind of got stocked away as well. So just for time's sake, um, I only am gonna talk, touch on the Berserker's expression, but if you just kind of look at the others, you can see that they all have their own personalities. A lot of people tend to like the queen because she looks like she's either bored, angry, upset. There's all kinds of interpretations. So they're all just their own personalities. And, and through my research, I found that it's the expressions on the faces which fascinate people the most. Um, I believe that their humanistic characteristics are relatable to all of us on some sort of level. We can connect to them as a reflection of, oh man, I have felt that before, especially like the queen. I definitely have felt like that before, um, which you don't always get when you're viewing other objects. Um, and as I mentioned previously, my interest in the chessmen is partially on values that we place upon them. That was my whole thesis. And indeed, one of, one of the values I've found through, through time is the ability for us to make that personal connection to them due to a sense of, of shared humanity we have with them. So feel free to go to the next, unless you have any questions for me. Nothing? Okay. Next screen. So, I will ask you something briefly, Stephanie, yeah. if, I, if I can. It's so you said there had never been any digs further, which I find interesting since they found this exactly. fabulous. Have there have been talks of other digs or, or? I've never come across anything. I know that the nunnery down um, further below the area where they think could have been the site, the nunnery definitely has had digs done there. They found sort of ancient rings and all kinds of things, but at the actual place in Uig where most people believe they're from, They've never done anything. I don't even think they know specifically on the beach and the exact location where to dig. It's a huge beach. Okay. So unless we had Mr. McLeod here to tell us or his notes or something <laughs> to say, where were they? I mean, they could dig up the whole beach and might not find anything. So if you want to hit I enter, care. go ahead. Out of curiosity to kind of caveat that, do you think that they're entertaining the idea of using drone technology to 3D scan? The beaches like uh, we see um, in Rome or um, there was just recently a drone scan of um, somewhere in Lebanon too that found a prehistoric settlement. Um, do you think there's any talks about that to see or is that I, just way too expensive or other world or I is this an uh, astrology? Heard. You would think for something like I said and, and this is quoted on the National Museum of Scotland's website they said that this is their greatest archaeological find ever in Scotland. And you'd think with something mm -hmm. like that, there might be more interest to see if there is anything still down there. And, you know, with this recent discovery in 2019, which was not in a sand dune, but in someone's drawer, it makes me think that maybe the chestnut is out of the ground and just, like I said, sitting on somebody's mantelpiece somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't heard any kind of rumors or anything, and I definitely keep up with what's going on if I hear more new things about them, and I haven't really seen anything um, that would constitute maybe the possibility of that. Mm. Be interesting to find out. Yeah, yeah for sure. So if you want to hit enter a few times, we're going to have some, some more pretty pictures here. I'm just going to briefly talk to you about the materials the pieces were made from. 
as well as a little bit on the craftsmanship, the artisans employed when creating the um, pieces. So the pieces themselves were mostly created by Atlantic walrus tusk. Sometimes it's historically known as Morse ivory. Um, five pieces in the collection, however, were actually made from sperm whale tusks. Um, ivory, especially at that, uh, especially that from the elephant um, was and still is, unfortunately, still sought after as a rare commodity used for the creation of finely carved goods, both for religious and secular purposes. Um, the use of and demand for ivory has always um, continued throughout time, um, and mostly because it's, it's de desired for its color and durability. It's always been rare, but some reason in the medieval era, sort of when we think the chessmen were made-ish, um, until the middle of the 13th century, the trade of importing elephant ivory essentially vanished from the archeological record. Um, there, you know, there's actually a gap in the record where you cannot find elephant ivory during that period of time. And scholars today still don't understand why that occurred, but it, there are theories that's possibly, you know, something to do with economics or politics. Um, but to kind of counteract that, people started using other things in its place, including teeth, bones, antlers, and horns from other animals. Um, and the material most sought after in this area became the walrus tusk. Um, walrus ivory became prized for several reasons. First, the tusks could grow, actually, if you hit one inner one more time, we'll see, there we go. The tusks can grow, uh, obviously, to a large length, not as large as elephants, but it was still, you know, better than maybe horns or teeth to be able to carve larger surfaces on. Um, second, when carved and polished, the tusks exhibit a creamy ivory color and shows even more luster than, than elephant ivory, actually. Um, and as the elephant ivory became almost impossible to get, and with the ever-expanding need for religious objects for the now-established Christian church, the new star, walrus ivory, um, became the hot commodity in Europe. So if you want to hit enter, just, I think it's three more times, I just put a few phrases up. Um, Kind of some of the things I've already talked about should be one more. There we go. Um, and while more plentiful walrus ivory was actually still a precious resource because of the treacherous means of procuring and then preparing the tusks for use. And in the first photo at the top, you can see how the pieces were cut for diff from different sections of the tusk. You can see their underside. So for the first one, that would be more towards the bottom of the tusk. The middle one is the dentine, kind of the inner bulb that you can see. And then the third picture would be towards the top where it gets smaller and smaller towards the tip. Um, and to the picture to the far right shows how the pieces may have been cut out of the tusk to fully utilize every part of the material they could because it still was a precious commodity. Um, and then in the center, you can actually see where two pieces came from the same section of the tusk and they still kind of match up even to this day. Um, and in the book I mentioned earlier that Dr. Caldwell um, wrote, I mentioned um, he did a lot of scientific experiments in this book and looked at a whole different range of ideas about the chessmen. One they decided to do was to see if they could figure out how many craftsperson possibly made the chessmen. Um, so base, they, they got a, you know, we think there are four potential sets considering how many were found. Uh, so Dr. Caldwell and his team wanted to see if that reflected, was reflected in the division of artisans. Um, so a biological anthropologist was brought in. Her name is Caroline Wilkinson. She's pretty well known for being the person who, um, she's, she's well known for facial reconstruction and she's the one that did what was it, the king in the car park in the UK, the big one that Richard III, when they found him and everybody went crazy. She's the one that did the facial reconstruction. Um, so she's pretty well known and she actually did an, you know, an anthropological study on their facial features and has come up with the fact that there are four or more master craftspersons working who worked on to create the collection. So next screen, if you'd like. So through the years since the collection was found, the hoard has been divided up. So here at the top, you can see three ex exhibition photos that I've taken. 
Um, as a museum professional, I devoted an entire chapter in my thesis just to the differences in the different exhibition styles each museum employs to tell the piece's story. Um, so just take a couple of seconds to kind of view them as I talk and see how drastically different they are. Um, so if you want to hit, go ahead and hit enter once for me. So the first one is the British Museum and they have 82 pieces in total of the collection. Now, if you think about the British Museum, they tout themselves as a global museum. They're, they're, they have collections from all over the world, all kinds of people can come see them. So you've got the chessmen situated on a global scale at that museum. Um, it has you know, the bulk of the collection um, and obviously the rest are kind of broken up elsewhere. So if you can hit number two for me, please. The second one in the middle is the National Museum of Scotland. They have 11 pieces and they are on a national scale. So it's the National Museum of Scotland and you have all Scottish collections. You do have some other collections from around the world, but obviously their specialty is on Scottish collections. So then you're seeing the chessmen in situated within items from their own, own world, their own area on that sort of national level. Um, and the next one we're going to talk about is kind of a different one. Um, so the last display piece, uh, the last exhibition photo there um, I'm going to talk about is actually on the Isle of Lewis. So the Highlands and Islands Council, who run the local government for the Isle of Lewis, proposed a refurbishment of a castle called Lewis Castle on the island. It's in Stornoway, which is the capital of the island. Um, the castle's from the Victorian era and was once owned by a peer of the realm as a country estate, and he decided to gift it to the island in 1923. Um, the local government was awarded a grant in 2011 to refurbish the muse or to refurbish the castle to be turned into a museum. Now, the museum was housed elsewhere, um, kind of tucked away on a, a random street, um, and I visited the museum before it was moved into the castle. Um, now, the Luz Castle was opened in 2016, a lot of fanfare, the, um, a lot of press, it was a big deal, um, and it was a big deal for a reason. So museum staff I interviewed before it was opened um, basically let me know that suddenly one day they got a call from the British Museum and they said, hey, would you like some chessmen to put on display? Um, this is the island where they were found, of course they want chessmen to put on display. Um, so they had to basically redo all of their plans for the museum to include these new chessmen that they were going to be gifted. And I say gifted, not gifted, but loaned. They're on permanent loan. So they didn't actually give them back to Scotland. They loaned them to Scotland. Um, and just as an aside here, um, the chessmen have been fought over between Scotland and England for a very long time. And as far as Scotland has actually gone to Parliament to petition for them to be returned. Um, and they didn't return them, but they loaned them. So take of it what you will. Um, and as you, like I was saying, they're the completely different, three different styles of exhibition of, of how they're used. But of course, when you have 11 and six versus 82 pieces, there's only so much you can do sometimes. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to kind of hit, oh, sorry, before you hit it, so six pieces from the British Museum are at the um, Island Museum uh, in Stornoway, and then you've got, again, a different context. You've got that local connection to where they came from, where they were found, that sort of thing. So they're exhibited in three kind of levels where different people from different places can see them. So now if you can hit enter, um, as I talked about earlier, the most recently discovered missing chessman was sold at auction. None of the pieces have ever really had a monetary value placed upon them, except for when they were first discovered and kind of broken up. Um, and Christie's auction house in London sold one chess piece for a staggering I can't even, 735,000 pounds or just roughly over $1 million. Um, and to date, we have no idea who bought it because it does not, it is not owned by any of the, the museums you see. So we're probably gonna assume it's in private hands, which was kind of heartbreaking for me because I feel like 
the chessmen have just been broken up and broken up and broken up. And it's one collection, but they're kind of scattered everywhere. And now we have one that's not even in museum hands. And it's for me, it's kind of sad because I feel like they should, it's one collection. It would be nice to see them all together. And now we have one that's definitely missing for who knows how long, maybe eternity. We might not ever find out where it went. So that's kind of where we are there. Um, so before we kind of go to the next slide, before it's going to kind of get into the popular culture section, do you either one of you have any questions about their background? Well, I was going to come and then have a question, but gosh, at that price, those collections are, I mean, needless to say, super valuable. <laughs> and uh, well, yeah, I mean, when you think about one piece was over a million dollars, there are 94 pieces, they're, they're priceless, to be honest, you can't, there's nothing in terms of value. And my whole thesis was about value. And I, you know, I wasn't doing anything monetary, because there was nothing monetary to compare it to, until 2019, when I had to rewrite my thesis to put monetary value in. Um, all of my values had been things like used for, you know, artistic and they're rare and their material, all these kind of sort of things you can't really measure. Then you get something out of the blue that says, oh, wait, we have a monetary. Let's put monetary value on how much they're worth. Um, so that was definitely a first for, for the collection, you know, at all. So it was, it was amazing. I watched the auction. Of course, I did. I recorded it because they're my babies. So of course I did. Um, and it was amazing. It was less than five minutes and it, it went sort of sky high. And I just honestly couldn't believe that it was being sold to private hands. So it kind of broke my heart a little bit. Well, that's how did the British Museum and National Museums of Scotland acquire their collections? So I actually have created a timeline. Um, part of my frustration at doing the research I did was you have all these original sources. I have all these primary sources, letters and things of looking in books and catalogs from auctions and things through, through my research. And no one had ever sat down and kind of compiled everything together. It was just, I did this, I researched this part, I have this note and nothing had ever been just kind of co cohesively put together. So part of the purpose of my research was to say, let's put everything together in one place Let's look at them in a holistic way when we're looking through every single aspect we possibly can to see if we can come up with more information. So for me, that was part of my original content, even though I'm bringing other people's work together, nothing, you know, nothing had been done like that to kind of draw everything together. And I created a timeline, which I didn't include here. Um, it is pretty extensive and pretty interesting timeline. So they were found on the beach. The, Mr. Um, Mr. McLeod was terrified of them. He thought that their little faces meant that they were sp sprites or fairies or devils. And in 1831, and he didn't know what they were. I would probably have been freaked out by tiny faces looking at me too. So he, thankfully his wife saw sense and went and got the local preacher involved. Um, then they went to a dealer in Stornoway who then sold part, well, I say part of them, the British Museum thought the collection we're getting was all of them, but he secretly had sold 11 to, or excuse me, 10 um, to a local collector in Scotland who was part of the Antiquaries of Scotland, which Antiquaries of Scotland turned into the National Museum at one point. Uh -huh. So he, he secretly, he secretly kind of sold 10 away without the British Museum knowing they thought they were getting the entirety of the collection when it was sold to them. And then their sort of linear line has never changed. It, it went to them like, was it 1832 or three? Um, and there was a scholar there who wrote a 92 page paper about them. It's fantastic, it's detailed. He had sketches, it's sort of the first scientific curatorial look at the chessmen. It's sort of the, um, the paper to end all papers about them. And um, they kind of just stayed there. So their line's pretty linear. And then you get the ones that were kind of stocked away. And then an another piece was added into their side. They had 11. And then it just kind of went from a couple different people, including a Lord, and eventually got to somebody's collection. And then it turned into the National Museum of Scotland eventually. So it's, it's their journey on the Scotland side is pretty interesting. It's pretty linear in the, the British side. But Man, were they angry that they didn't get the whole collection. 
<laughs> and you can he, he tells you in his paper that he's furious that they didn't get them all they kind of they told us a lie and all this kind of thing so um oh, it's dear. pretty interesting yeah, yeah so <laughs> Thanks. it's pretty interesting so kind of the next section is all about actual use in popular culture and i thought it might be something you know sometimes history can be well, not to me, but sometimes to some people, history can be a bit boring and stodgy. And so I thought maybe talk about something a bit fun. Um, and I'm going to basically go through how the objects are used in popular culture. And when I say popular culture, I'm thinking of things like TV, books, films, um, anything that, you know, people are going to see. Um, and, you know, once I, like I was saying to you all early before we started recording, I, once I started looking for them, I can't unsee them. They're everywhere. And I do have friends that unfortunately are feeling the same effects after hearing me go on about them for nine years. Um, I get them, they tag me in all kinds of things and say, oh, did you see this? So it's catching and you might now see them from now on. You might see them yourselves in different places and it's pretty comical actually. Um, and to date, and of course this changes frequently, I found the chessmen in, if you want to hit the next slide for me, Tori. Please, it's helpful now you have little helpers to find you other yeah. chess pieces to add. <laughs> Community. <laughs> Two more minions now. Hello. I, know. I can't wait. I can't wait. If you can go ahead and just hit enter, it'll all come up at once. So, um, one more time. I'm sorry, twice. There we go. Um, so these are some of the places I found the chessmen to date. And as I was, it was telling you too, before I started doing this, uh, working on this this past weekend, kind of going through setting up everything for the presentation, I discovered there are two more movies I didn't know that they were in. And I did my research to find as many places as possible where they've been included. And just goes to show they're honestly, they're everywhere. And, you know, as much as I tried to bring everything together, sometimes you just can't. Um, it, it's in more places than you actually realize. So in the kind of following slides, um, you're going to see, you know, how they're used in each one. So we're going to start out with movies and we do have some inclusions of videos and I really hope they work. So without doubt, if you want to kind of go to the next screen and we can see if my handy dandy thing works. And just to, just to the side before we actually start playing the video here. Um, I've mentioned, like I said, I mentioned to people in the past that my thesis was on the chessmen, nothing. As soon as I tell them Harry Potter, oh, I know exactly what that is. Everybody seems to know what that is. Um, despite the fact they're the, you know, one of the top 10 things to see in the British Museum, they're always on the top 10 list. You know, they're Scotland's greatest find, nothing. Um, but then you tell them, hey, they were in Harry Potter. Oh, everybody knows that. So it's just an interesting kind of perception of how, in, you know, how pervasive popular culture and how influential it can be. Um, and I, so this is just an aside as well. So um, obviously Harry Potter, pretty much the entire world knows what it is. And um, through my research, I've kind of created my own wild notion of how the paces may have kind of come to be included in the movie. Um, there is no, this is my silliness. There is no, nothing to back this up. It's just me being fun and thinking maybe this could have happened. Um, you know, I tried to contact JK Rowling and her people to ask specific questions. I didn't hear anything. So I, this just is my own speculation. So she calls them wizard's chess in both the book and the movie. Now in the book, there's no description tying them specifically that would make you think it's the Lewis Chessmen. They're just called Wizard's Chess. They get up and they're animated. Um, and when writing the first novel for the series, she actually would sit in a cafe called the Elephant House Cafe. And it's located just a few steps from the National Museum of Scotland. You can kind of see each other from the road. Um, and the cafe now tells itself as the birthplace of Harry Potter. Lots of tourist great things happen there. Now, again, I have no basis for my hypothesis, but wouldn't it be magical to think that she went into the National Museum of Scotland looking for inspiration and saw these little guys and said, oh, I'll make magical chess pieces. Um, I have no idea. Um, hopefully she's just utilizing their, um, you know, creative in her head. Let's play a game. Let's make it magical. Um, there is a wonderful YouTube video, not this one, by a British museum curator. His name is Irvin Finkel. He's fantastic. He's comical. 
Um, and he noted in the video that the props person working on the film, um, actually her father and grandfather were British museum curators at some point. So she knew the collection, she knew what they had. She also knew him and she knew that he had a replica set and the museum itself was out of replica sets to purchase when she went looking for them. So she talked to him and said, hey, can I borrow your set? He had collected these over time through his childhood. He was fascinated with them. He doesn't even work in their department at the British Museum, but he loves them nonetheless. And so it was actually his set that are used here in the, the, um, in the movie. Um, and so in case people out there might not know this script, this clip, which it's possible. Um, so it's between Ron and Harry, who are two main characters in the film. It's at the Great Hall at Hogwarts where they go to school and it's near Christmas time. So you see a lot of decorations and such in the back. Everyone's getting ready to go home for the holidays. And then we see our duo here are engaged in this game of chess. So if you wanna hit play, we're gonna hope we can hear it and see it. Knight to E5. Queen to E5. That's totally barbaric. That's wizard's chess. I see you've packed. See, you haven't. Change of plans. My parents decided to go to Romania to visit my brother Charlie. He's studying dragons there. Good. You can help Harry then. He's going to go and look in the library for information on Nicholas Flamel. We've looked a hundred times. Not in the restricted section. Happy Christmas. I think we had a bad influence on her. <laughs> so, as you can see, that just over a minute of airtime, the clip has become one of the only ways some people recognize Jasmine. Um, and again, as I noted earlier, that's the power of popular culture. So, um, for me, when you think about the big of the big to be in, Harry Potter would be one of them. Number two would be Disney. So, if you want to hit next, um, I'm going to have to get you to excuse me for the next one the sound quality, sound quality for the next one is going to be a little don't hit yet don't hit quite yet so this is disney pixar's movie called brave um you know with harry potter being the power the power house film that it is but you get a disney one involved surely that's got to be the next best thing um, and culturally speaking, you can't, can't get much better than Disney. So this movie is set in ancient Scotland. It tells the story of a young fiery princess taking her own fate into her hands. Um, it's story, the story centers around a mother-daughter relationship, um, which is actually kind of an original for a Disney film. And it's also one of the few times a Disney princess has no love interest. Um, so animators for the film went to Scotland to gain inspiration before creating uh, they wanted to see the landscape to capture details. They also visited the National Museum of Scotland to um, look at artifacts to be historically accurate as much as they could. And while at the museum, they uh, took note of the chessmen, particularly so since the hoard demonstrates the importance of the female the role of the queen. And here you've got a princess and her mother, the queen. So that's kind of an interesting um, relationship there. They don't actually talk about the queen in reference to the chessboard at all in the film that just kind of went to the side. Um, but it is still an interesting um, kind of juxtaposition that they, they spotted when they were there. Um, the pieces are still used in an important way. They demonstrate the history of the kingdom that they live in and the, you know, the princess, her name is Merida. Um, her mother notes to her that legends are lessons that ring with truth. So again, please forgive the quality of this video. I had to do some very creative things to try to get this on the screen. There was no YouTube clip of this video anywhere. So I went through all kinds of ways to get this. So I'm sorry for the quality and hopefully the sound was okay. Mother, sitter, 
yours. Marriage. Once there was an ancient kingdom. Oh, Mom. Ancient kingdom. Its name, long forgotten, ruled by a wise and fair king who was much beloved. And when he grew old, he divided the kingdom among his four sons, that they should be the pillars on which the peace of the land rested. But the oldest prince wanted to rule the land for himself. He followed his own path, and the kingdom fell to war and chaos and ruin. That's a nice story. It's not just a story, Merida. Legends are lessons. They ring with truths. Ugh, Mom. I would advise you to make your peace with this. The clans are coming to present their suitors. It's not fair. Ugh, Merida, it's marriage. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, it's kind of a short clip there, um, but it, it's something I saw Tori's face when she's like, oh, it's like you seemed like you remembered when you saw that. You're like, I remember that now. It's like they get into your consciousness and you don't realize, like I said, until I started looking for them, I'm like, they're everywhere. Um, so yeah, just uh, obviously it's set in Scotland. It's, it's kind of interesting that it's the pieces set in Scotland, found in Scotland, kind of all together there. So I really wanted to include that one. Um, and kind of we're going to move on from there to some TV shows. And depending on time-wise, we might not get through them all. It just depends on what you guys want to do. Um, but we'll start out with the first one. You can just change the screen. That was an interesting one. So um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, I've just recently found those two extra films. Um, but of course, with time constraints, I only kind of presented the two before. Um, now we have, like I said, some of the television shows I've found them in. We have a very unlikely source, I think, for the first one. Um, it's in a zombie apocalypse. TV show called The Walking Dead, very popular TV show in the States. Well, I guess all over the world, to be honest, in popular culture, that is. Um, so I want to give you just a brief background about the show in case if you're like me, you've never watched it before. Um, so it's set in sort of uh, the apocalypse has happened. There are zombies walking around everywhere. It's based on a comic series, this um, TV show. And survivors are trying to stay alive under this constant threat. Civilization basically is crumbled. And so groups of people, they make up their own communities and they are survivors just setting their own sets of laws and they create their own armies and militia. So in the video, you'll see a man who's known as the governor. He's one of the main characters. This is actually from season four. Um, this episode in particular is from um, episode six, Live Bait. They're actually in the one right after it, but I didn't include that, that here as well. Um, so the governor, he's a leader of a community in Georgia whose governing style we're gonna say is less than saintly. Um, he wars with a neighboring leader and creates an army to go and battle with them. After the battle is lost, the governor kind of goes crazy in a rage and kills a lot of members of his own community. Um, those that were not killed didn't abandon him and he kind of leaves the area to go traveling. In the episode, he is living with a family, kind of staying with them for a little while. And there's a little girl in the, in the, the clip, her name is Megan, and the governor and she kind of bond while they're together. So in the clip, he's teaching her how to play chess. And as you'll see through uh, the clip, uh, he's portraying the pieces as basically war on a word. And we see that interesting juxtaposition again between the game of war and then war that's actually happening. Um, and he's the governor, he's the leader, he's the king, if you want to call it, of, of the war that he, he led. Um, but this is that clip from the film, or the TV show, if you want to go ahead and play it now. What is it? Chess. Looks hard. Huh? Well, maybe for some folks, but you're smart. You'll catch on quick. What's this one called? That's a pawn. They're your soldiers. Do they die? Sometimes. Do you lose if they die? No, not necessarily. You can lose a lot of soldiers, but still win the game. That's the game.
What are you doing? You'll see. Looks like you. So um, the next one we're going to talk about here is from a show that's a little bit more recent. Um, it's actually a TV show called Castle Rock, and it is a Stephen King production that was done in collaboration with the streaming service Hulu. And it's set in Castle Rock, Maine, and is the name of a fictional town where many of his books take place. The premise of the show is to kind of look at certain characters and themes again, kind of squish them together kind of in one place. Um, the show revolves around the main character, Henry, who is a death row lawyer going home to defend an inmate. Um, when he gets home, he and his mother who are estranged kind of reunite. Um, we find out early on that the viewer, uh, we find out as a viewer early on that Ruth, her name is, is Ruth, his mother, she's got a partner called Alan, and we find out she suffers from dementia. Um, her partner at some point prior to the episode um, gave her a set of chess pieces, um, and the co-creator of the show, Sam Shaw, said in an article that he envisioned Ruth uh, to be an Icelandic literature scholar. Um, and so that the chessmen were what the show thought of when they were trying to find something that was a Viking chess set. Um, throughout this, this uh, season, we see Ruth, she places the pieces all around her home. And for her, that is a way to know that she's not in a dementia state, she's in reality. Um, and she actually says in, I'm not sure if it's this episode or another one, she says that they're her breadcrumbs and that if she finds them in sort of the refrigerator, she knows it's, it's now and not then. And she kind of equates them to her, her way of finding her way out of the woods. Um, so this particular episode, they're, they're, they're throughout the whole season, but this one is pretty interesting. It's called The Queen, um, and it's kind of aptly titled. Watchers are given an opportunity to go from being witnesses to the effects of her dementia to basically active participants. And the episode in total chronicles the viewer through a day in, in her life and her memories. Um, and we come to recognize that Ruth is essentially the Lewis queen. Um, so if you wanna go ahead and play that one. the screen if you look at the top left corner there's that fantastic youtube video that if you have time to go watch it at some point it's Irvin finkel talking about the chamber of secrets with his chessmen and he's just great so that's what it looks like if you just kind of google Irvin finkel on youtube that's it there so if you get the chance to go look at it do do it's it's pretty fun to watch um so the next one i'm gonna talk about is probably going to be unfamiliar to most people in North America. It's a TV show called Nog Nog, and it debuted in the UK in 1959, and to my knowledge has never really crossed the ocean uh, to be over here by watching, you know, by Americans and, you know, North Americans watching it. It ran until 1965, and then again in 1982. 
There was also a set of illustrated books that were published around the same time that the show was aired. Um, and even in the UK, people of a certain age may have never heard of it. But for those who have, it's an extremely familiar part of Bond's childhood memories. The show was created by Peter Furman and illustrator Oliver Postgate, and it tells the story of a group of characters called the Northmen, basically the Northmen. <laughs> um, and the storyline centers around a family whose royal lineage, lineage is in trouble. The king is ill, and he's going to be succeeded by the wicked brother Nogbad the Nog, great name, um, unless the gentle prince his heir can find a marriageable princess. Um, so I actually had personal correspondence with Peter Furman back in 2015. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2018, so I feel very privileged I had the chance to talk to him about the series. Um, he noted that as an art student, he originally came up with the idea for Nog and the Nog when he first saw the chessmen in the, in the British Museum. He became enchanted by what he called, quote, their simplistic but expressional nature, and, quote, became besotted with what he called, quote, Nog mania. He reflected in his email to me that he knew that they had been waiting for 700 years for someone to tell their story, um, but countered that he was so bad at history and learning facts, he just made up his own. Um, he penned the story, showing it to his illustrator friend. They also, he also fell in love with it, and thus Nog and the Nog came to be. Um, Furman and Oliver created the characters in the story to actually mimic the appearance of the Lewis Chessman, including the title's main character, Noggin. In 1994, special stamps were produced in the UK to commemorate famous children's characters, and Nog and the Nog was featured. So, we don't have to play the whole clip, it's about two minutes. You can just get an essential view at some of the characters. So enjoy, this was the kind of introduction to the first ever aired. of the north, where the black rocks stand guard against the cold sea. In the dark night that is very long, the men of the Northlands sit by the great log fires and they tell a tale. They tell how a prince built a long ship and sailed in it beyond the black ice at the edge of the world to bring home his bride from the land of the midnight sun. Noggin the Nog was the name of the prince, young and strong and fair as the men of the Northlands are. And he was the son of Canute, king of the Nogs, the ruler of this land of dark forest and snow. This land of mountains and valleys, of deep narrow bays where the sea roars between the black rocks and the wind howls cold in the night. There was the little town of wooden houses, clustered by a bay where the sea was calm. And there above it was the small castle, the castle of King Canute. Now every morning as the sun rose, King Canute put on his crown and took his morning walk up the steep path beside his castle to the rock above. It's just good to actually see the characters, how, you know, the king looks like a Lewis king, how Noggin looks like, almost like the berserker you see on the screen with the conical hat and his, his shield. So they were very specific to almost mimic exactly some of, obviously not the helmet with horns because mm -hmm. none of the chessmen have that. Um, but <laughs> inserted of the characters, it's, it's kind of interesting to see. It's just a little clip there. So um, kind of from the TV shows and movies, we're going to, how are we in time? Of the town. Are we OK in time? Do we need to go faster? OK. So <laughs> um, I'm just going to talk a little bit. Did you have a question, Tom? I did not. I'm just uh, fascinated that I know about Nog and the Nog now. Yay! <laughs> yeah, I think you can watch some episodes online. There's definitely, you can purchase, I think, the children's book series. I actually really want to kind of look at them all. Just I just have only looked at a few clips. There are people mm -hmm. that if they love Nog and the Nog, they love Nog and the Nog. Um, again, it's, it's people of a certain age that they remember their childhood watching black and white TV, you know, it's Nog and the Nog on Saturday or whatever date is aired. So it's a, it's a big part of a lot of people's memories.
Well, it's new to me and I've jotted it down, so thank you. <laughs> Even so just a little bit of Monty Python. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the guy talking in the background is fantastic. I'm like, I could listen to him talk all day. <laughs> yeah, that's a great voice. <laughs> yeah. So from there, we're going to move on to some books where the chessmen have been featured. And I'm going to try to get through this a little quick here just because there is a lot. Um, so if you want to hit the screen twice. There we go. So um, the first book here is probably by an author that most of us have heard before. Um, she's definitely something very um, pervasive in popular culture as is her character, and I'm gonna mess up his name because I can never pronounce it properly. Is it Quaro? Hopefully I got that right. Um, so he's her you know, main investigator in a lot of her novel, short stories, that sort of thing. He's well known, he's had TV shows. He's the main person in this particular book called The Big Four. Um, and when she actually killed him off in 1975, he even received his own obituary in the New York Times. Um, and to this day, he's the only fictional character who's ever had that honor. So we situate the Lewis Chessman within that. Um, in terms of being in popular culture. I don't think you can get much bigger in book wise than you think Agatha Christie, everybody has heard of her. Um, and the big four was actually published in 1927. Unlike a lot of her novels, it contained a series of short stories. Um, so just to kind of try to briefly go through this uh, about the context where the chessmen are, there kind of opens the scene. There are two men playing chess and one of them dies while having a chess piece in his hands. Um, they first think that maybe it was for the other player who um, was Russian born, that maybe it was some kind of conspiracy that he was supposed to have the chess piece or whatever and trying to place it on a board and the other guy passed away. Um, he was a former revolutionary. So we thought, oh, he, we killed the wrong person. Um, so our investigator, um, Mr. Poirot himself is kind of on the case. He's, um, he and his friend decide to go to the morgue to um, take a look at the other poor unfortunate souls remains. They find a chessman and I quote a white bishop um, and it was clasped in his hands at the time of his death and we're told that the um, it's from a quote very beautiful set of carved ivory chessmen. Um, and as the residents of the Russian born gentleman, they actually examine the entire set. And um, it's, it's noted that they are quote exquisite and produces, um, you know, they're able to see the entire set together. So later on, our, our main investigator um, comes back with the chess piece that they found in the unfortunate soul's hands. They actually find that it has a silver rod um, through the center, a metal rod through the center of the chessman. And what happens was, is when he was playing on an, an exquisitely carved silver chessboard, it actually electrocuted him when he went to put the piece on. So of course, you know, through history, there have been other ivory chessmen, probably none as famous as the Lewis chessmen. It's not, it's not a given that the chessmen were the ones she referenced in the novel, um, but we can hypothesize it might have been. So a little bit about Christie's background. She was um, she lived in the UK through her marriage, and she was um, married to an archaeologist, Max Mullowan. She was able to travel with him, explore finds. She herself actually became interested in the subject of archaeology and utilized some of her experiences from field work in her novels. So. Well, she's no longer alive for me to ask her, hey, were you thinking about the chessmen when you wrote your book? Um, we, can, we can hope that maybe she heard of the Lewis chessmen, maybe she knew about this fantastic find as an archaeologist and her husband's an archaeologist. Maybe we can speculate that, you know, that was in her frame of consciousness. Um, and then we'll see this, this reprint of her book here was 1965. It's actually the only, and it's, it's a defunct publisher called Fontana who published it. Um, and it very clearly shows a Lewis Bishop on the front. However, this is the only version of this book, the only print cover that actually has a Lewis chess piece on it. Other reprints are more stylized, traditional chess uh, figures. So 
we can only hope that maybe that's what she was talking about, but there's no direct reference other than this picture on the front of the book. So for the next book, if you want to hit enter for me a couple times, twice to be exact, this um, might be an author you may never have heard of. I'm going to be perfectly honest and say I hadn't. I just happened to find, come across this author. Um, and it's another mystery novel. Um, and it's, it's another murder mystery novel. So it's, they seem to be quite popular in this genre. Um, I guess they add some kind of air of mystery or fascination. I'm not quite, I'm not quite sure why they're, they're great for mysteries. Um, and it utilizes a gentleman called Ernie Biscuits. He's our main investigator here. Um, and he receives an ivory chessman from an old chum who's found uh, dead in a canal. And when Ernie and his cohorts unwrap the parcel left from a solicitor, the object is described as looking like, quote, a little Viking crusader. Um, Ernie, in fact, is, uh, has no idea what he's holding. Some of his friends tell them that it's actually the Lewis Chessman and it's a rook to be exact. Um, his friends then also note that the missing piece, uh, so it, they note that there had been a piece that had been um, stolen from that, they call it that museum, years ago, um, but they believe the missing piece was a queen. We can assume that best as, goodness, I got my, myself mixed up here. If you look, it says East London Adventures Club. Since it's based in London, let's just assume that that museum is the British Museum. Um, and, um, you know, we're just going to assume it's that museum. So they actually do a bit of a test to see if the chessman is real. They, they heat a pin up and they place it on the piece and it apparently smells instantly of a dentist's office, which for them confirms that it is um, a real, you know, tooth tusk. Um, the piece is described by the author as being a Viking warrior with a pointed helmet, drilled eyes, and large teeth biting the top of the shield. So talking about my friend the Berserker here, um, and then they talk about some monetary value, how it would prove to be popular on the black market, which broke my heart a little bit. Um, and in the novel, there is an actual titer, titled uh, chapter called The Lewis Chessman, um, and they kind of discuss the history of the pieces throughout there. Um, and so I did actually have some correspondence with the author as well. And he relayed to me that the inspiration for the book came after a long ago viewing at the British Museum, which lit the spark for the book. He also responded that he likes adding historical references to his novels. And that at the time the novel was being written, he was looking for some kind of historical hook. Um, and it just happened to coincide with a time when the chessmen were making a world tour. And for him, that was perfect timing. And that's kind of how the book came to be. So we can go on to the next screen. Now, this one might be a little bit more familiar. Peter May is a better, he's a pretty well-known um, author. He's has a lot of series, again, mystery murder novels. Um, and he's actually Scottish born. Um, and he is this series of books he wrote was called the Lewis Trilogy. And Chessman that we have listed here is the last in that series. Um, I did get, now Peter May is a pretty big author and the fact that he talked to me, he doesn't do very often apparently according to his person that talks for him. So he did actually directly correspond with me. So I was pretty, pretty fortunate to be able to talk to him. Um, and he noted that each of the books involve elements that are unique to the culture and location of Lewis. Um, so he was originally a script writer for TV shows in the UK, including one he co-produced called Macker. And Macker was an extremely popular Gallic soap opera, which was filmed in the Isle of Lewis. Um, in his email to me, he noted that his work on the show from 1992 until 98 was his first introduction to the Outer Hebrides. He, um, while he was there, he kind of immersed himself in the local culture and life during filming and the experience for him was just profound, had a profound effect on him. And it was a direct influence um, on his decision to create this series 15 years later. Um, so the plot, just gonna go over really briefly, it's book three. 
Um, it's around a gentleman called Finn. He's a police detective that moves back to his home island of Lewis when he finds out he has a child he didn't know about. Um, and he's basically working as a security guard on the island when the book opens. He has a friend called Whistler, and Whistler lives in Uig, where the chessmen were found. He finds driftwood on the beach to make carvings of the chessmen for tourists. Um, the reader were given a view, I say a view, we're giving him a description of some of the chess pieces as they kind of look around in his, his house. Um, and he and Finn kind of have a recollection of childhood and they grew up at school learning how the chessmen came to be um, on the island. Um, and May relayed in his email that he garnered all of his source material uh, from both print and local experts. Um, then kind of interesting, as we saw from a few slides on the front when I talked about the statue that's at the site, um, there actually are wooden statues all over the island. So that's just one of, I think, four that are on the island. Um, and so Whistler in the book is actually commissioned to create large, these large pieces of chessmen for a chessmen gala day, where for one day all the pieces are reunited on um, in Uig just for one day. So the video here, now, now May, um, there's no, if you see, it's definitely nothing to do with a chess piece on the front. There's nothing that would relate that to Lewis Chessman, but on his website, embedded in on his website, he has this video and it's called The Chessman. We don't have to watch the whole thing. You can just watch a little bit to start, but it basically is all the photos he took for research purposes to write this book. Um, and you'll see from the start, it has a lot of pictures of the chessmen to start. Um, and it is a Gallic kind of lyrical song in the background, kind of adds to the scene. So if you just want to play just a few minutes of it, we can kind of move on after that. Is <laughs> watch a little bit of it to kind of see, you know, he's obviously, um, the, the place is really important to him. He took a lot of pictures and stills and videos and things, and those are all on Lewis. Um, and of course, the chessmen were right up front at the beginning. Um, so from adult books, we're going to kind of move on to kids' books, which are super fun. And if you want to just kind of put them all on the screen, there's three. Might as well just get them all up here. So uh, the first one, um, as so this, there are two pages. We're going to go through these briefly. There's so many, and I even left some out. Um, so it's a, there's a plethora of kids' books, um, and I say kids, children, young adults kind of thing, um, and they feature the chessmen. And if you actually look at all three um, books in front of you, each one of them actually have a representation of a chess piece on the book cover. Um, so for, like I said, for time constraints, I won't go too, too deep into the plots of everything. Um, just kind of briefly highlight the books and a little bit what they're about. So the first one's the chess piece magician. The author I spoke to, his name is Douglas Brenton. He's actually an English teacher in Edinburgh. He wrote the story for his children who he used to read to when they were young. Um, and he kind of read it to them while they were young, 
chucked it away in a drawer, didn't really think about it until his son was older and said, hey, dad, do you remember that story? He pulled it out. He entered it into a literary prize, actually was second runner up and was offered a contract to publish the book. Um, so for him, he thought that the even though we've got a little bit of a fanciful tale of their beginning, he thought it wasn't fanciful enough. Um, so he thought I'll come up with another idea of how the story happened. And that was what he did for his children. Um, so just a quick aside, the story is based in Lewis and involves a young boy called Corey. He goes to the island every summer with his family while exploring USA. Um, he finds a large hole in the ground with an artifact inside. A young local girl tells him the story of the chessmen. Once he's at home, he's asleep. He's woken up by an unknown entity. The artifact he finds has split open and inside is the chess piece you see. And actually the chess piece turns out to be a magical wizard that helps um, both Corey and the young girl, the trio, magical trio. They help ward off the, um, they save the island from a, a local sea dragon. So we've got a lot of great adventures involving a chessman that comes to life. But the next one in the middle is by our friend Urban Winkle again. Um, again, he has no relation, or say relation, he has, the chessmen are not in his department at the National or at the British Museum, but he is obsessed with them. So he actually wrote this little fun novel in 1995, and it's his interpretation, fun, whimsical of, you know, what happened to the chessmen. Um, it's, pretty comic throughout. It actually makes me giggle every time I read it. So he actually goes from their incarceration under the ground, which if you can see the picture, it's one of the queens. She's brushing her hair out. They're underground. They're all kind of um, hid and stocked away, waiting for someone to find them. Um, and he kind of goes through their story, how they get to the British Museum. He talks about how they were found by Mr. McLeod and his cow. Um, he talks about them on an adventure, AKA they're split up. So they, they kind of get split up and part goes to the British Museum, part goes to Scotland. He um, kind of displays the fact that the, cheap, the pieces feel sorrowful, but they're, they're split up. Um, it's kind of an interesting, we're putting feelings onto objects there. They're sorrowful that their, their friends and partners and things have been split up and sent elsewhere. Um, but he does go through, I thought was quite interesting. He goes through, and talks about the chessmen being on display that have been, they've been there as witnesses throughout history. So they sort of see at the British Museum, you know, World War II when everything was getting bombed all around London and they're, they're witnesses to history. They're these little people inside of a, he equates them to being animals in a cage zoo. Um, so it is quite whimsical. It's a good way for children to learn um, about this in a, in a fun way. And they have a little party at the end because all the chessmen are reunited for a special exhibition in 1993 where they're, they're all back together. So they have a bit of a party, but then they all make sure they're back in their respective places once the museum opens. So a little bit like Night at the Museum. The last one here on this screen is called The Chessmen of Doom. And I had never heard of the author, but apparently he is a well-known American author of young adult books. Um, it's, he features his serial um, character as a 13-year-old called Johnny and his friend Fergie and a neighbor, a professor. It takes place in 1950s America, which is definitely a far cry from the British homes of the Lewis Horde. Um, and obviously you can see here the cover art. It's actually, this is the first edition cover of the book. Any other editions do not feature the chess pieces. They do feature the more traditional stylized chess pieces. Um, and just, it's kind of a mystery. There's um, intrigue, the chessmen are, basically stolen from the British Museum. They were to be used by an evil person in a cult um, ritual. And they, of course, save the day, save the chess pieces and return them to the British Museum. Um, so that's just a, a brief synopsis of those three. So if you want to move on, we'll get through those pretty quickly too. So there's our good friend Nog in the Nog. Just put up here, obviously we've already talked about the TV show. I just wanted to show cover art for the book series that was published in tandem with the show. And we kind of already have a background about the show. So I'm gonna just kind of move on to the, the middle one. Again, you'll see 
obviously Nog and Minog is not actually the Lewis Chessman, but you see the other two definitely are on their cover art. Um, the second book here in the middle is called The Sleeping Army, and the author, her name is Francesca Simon. She's actually the author of a really popular UK children's series called Horrid Henry. Um, and the story follows a young girl um, in London that we wouldn't recognize today. It's actually, they still worship Viking gods. And we see Freya looking at the chessmen when she's in the British Museum. Her dad is a security guard there. She actually sees a horn nearby and as most children, she can't resist it. She blows the horn and she creates havoc where museum exhibitions all around her crumble and she is transported in a vortex with three Lewis chessmen. Basically, they're trying to um, restore the gods to Asgard and there's a whole adventure and the chess pieces come to life. And um, I had, again, the fortunate um, chance to speak to the author herself and just kind of get some insight on how she kind of came up with her story. And again, she saw a poster for the chessmen in the British Museum in the 70s. She was struck by their sadness and she wanted to know why were they so sad and what happened to them. Um, and it was her sad, it was their sadness that um, created the idea of a sleeping army, basically just stoic little soldiers waiting to be awakened at some point. Um, and that kind of started her off in her story. So she also noted to me that out of over 50 novels that she has penned, this one is one of her favorites and that the Lewis Chessmen are one of her most favorite subjects ever. The last one I hear, have here on the screen is one of my personal favorites I found. Um, it was done in 1993 after the author's death and is highly illustrated. I absolutely adore this book. It's like a big library book. I actually bought it used from a library um, and it's just got these beautiful glossy pages. They're super bright colors. And the um, illustrator is well known for their pink and ink works of animals. Um, the author herself was known for writing historical children's books, many of which uh, centered around famous legends and lore of the British islands. Um, so the intro, um, we tell, you know, we learn about Mr. McLeod again in the book. Um, now this setting for the pieces, it's actually in, in quote, the most beautiful garden in the world. And there is grass and stone work to make to look like a giant chessboard. There are, um, and it says that there are the people of the garden sometimes play on. And so the people of the garden are the white chess set here. Um, and they're all given Scandinavian or Norse names in the book and each have an exotic pet, as you see the cheetah there. That's basically like a bit of a familiar for them. Um, and at night, each ch chess piece believes that in dreams that it's another fantastical animal with which um, they share traits with each other. Now, one day, one of the knights declares his love for the king. The king hears this, or declares his love for the queen. The king hears this. He's brokenhearted. And because of his, um, some of his relationships start crumbling. And when this rift in the garden their um, garden's defenses are shattered and the red horde, so the red chessmen in the back, are able to invade and they decide to war it out on the game board. And through the process of the war, many pieces, they're kind of, they, they, they make them to be human. They're bleeding and dying on the side of the board. Um, and so the queen decides that they need to wake up the garden to um, you know, defeat what's going on. So she kisses the grass, the garden wakes up, the chess pieces, uh, the white chess pieces are all turned into animals from their dreams, and they're able to defeat the, the red horde. So I was unable to find any information at all about why the author may have written this book, if she had any kind of interest or correlation to the chessmen. Um, but with her love of historical legends, it's a possibility that she had heard their story and kind of created her book based off that. So if you want to go to the next screen. This is a bit of an unusual one. If you want to hit one more time. This is, there we go. Um, it's a bit of an unusual book. A little bit different than what we've looked at so far, and it's called Press, and I'm probably mispronouncing his name, Professor Munakata's British Museum Adventure. Um, so this is a graphic novel specifically from the manga genre, 
And it's a, a popular Japanese form of comic book art that has come to saturate popular culture in recent years. And the novel follows the professor who has been a, an, and I quote, an India jo Indiana Jones-like character in this genre since the 90s. Um, his stories, again, are very mystery in style. Um, and he, in this particular one, he goes to, to vis visit the British Museum. Um, and the author who also went to visit the British Museum was inspired by the unique setting um, of the museum for to place his character in. So he created special sketches just for an exhibition that the British Museum had for him. And these sketches went on to basically create the book. Um, and to start the story, to kind of go through it, the professor is going to the museum. He's a well-known folk folklorist. He's doing a talk there. Um, that evening, police are called to Stonehenge, where they discover the stones have been stolen by unknown terrorists. And in their place are a set of pawns. Um, the police go to the British Museum, where it's revealed that the pawns are part of the Lewis Horde. Uh, the professor is informed that the pawns have a role as the hostage. As you'll see here on the screen, he's got some of the chess pieces lined up. And the first one at the bottom, it says a pawn is in the loose chess set actually has another role as a hostage. Kind of an interesting thing we're going to get into. and We're going to probably just really briefly touch on it and then quickly move on to it because it's kind of political. Um, so as he leaves this room, he goes into the next room right next door and he kind of crashes into the Parthenon marbles and notes that Greece is calling for their return. Um, he kind of said that about the chess pieces as well. And it's a later discussion reveals that the professor himself is adamantly against repat repatriation of these objects and is a true friend to the British Museum where he thinks the objects should remain. Um, in the hall where the marbles are located, a Lewis Bishop is left behind to create a sort of bread trail of pieces throughout the galleries that lead to other contested objects within the museum. And a ransom note is found with the demand that the objects be returned to their rightful owners, um, or else Stonehenge is going to be demolished by the dropping of the stones onto London monuments. Um, so again, I just kind of want to briefly draw your attention to some po politics going on here. Um, we've seen, you know, the chessmen have been, have that, the Scotland has asked for the chessmen to be returned. Greece has asked, has been asking the British Museum for years and years and years for the Parthenon marbles to be returned. You got that whole political thing going in here where the chessmen are kind of involved with the, the Parthenon marbles and the whole send all the objects back kind of situation. Um, and it's kind of an interesting relationship because you have the author who, you know, when he created this, he now has this exposure by being in the British Museum. He has this exposure to the English speaking, a large population of the English speaking world he may have not had exposure to prior. And then you have the British Museum who benefited from this relationship because they have someone saying, oh, look, the objects need to remain where they are. So we're just going to stop there at that one and not talk about that anymore and just kind of leave that political thing where it is um, and kind of move forward to social media and we're almost done here. So if you want to hit enter for me. And so if you want to just do one at a time for me, I'll just tell you when the next one. So really quickly, this is Facebook. Most people know what it is, but there are so many instances of adjustment on Facebook. A lot of them come from the National Museum of Scotland, British Museum, but you do have individual people that do them as well. This is only a slice of some of the ones I've collected over my time doing research. As you see here, someone built an entire cake, chest and cake, and it say it weighs two stone and a stone is 14 pounds each. So it's 28 pounds of cake with a Lewis Chessman board on it. So someone had a lot of detail to do there. Um, so if you want to hit the next one, this is a, I actually got the date right on this one. It's 2013 and someone decided when we had some great snow in January that year to create a berserker um, and then posted it to the National Museum of Scotland. Um, so again, this is just a random person said, let's just make a berserker out of of snow, because why not? Um, so if you'll hit enter again. So this one was, it's a meme that there are actually chessmen memes and they're great. 
This one was just on a random place called Medieval Merriment, and it was just a chessman meme, and I just thought it was interesting. I don't actually get the reference myself, but there are some pretty funny ones out there. And if you'll hit enter again. This one I kind of adore. This is actually um, in the Stornoway Airport. This is one of those wooden figures that I was talking to you about that are all over the island. This is advertising the Hebrew Celtic Festival. It's a festival held in the summer on the Isle of Lewis. And they basically were saying, look, we've got our marketing stuff up and look, it's right beside the chessmen in the airport. Um, so I thought it's, it was just interesting that they, you know, put their advertisement at right, right over there, right beside their most, their island's most famous thing. Um, and if you'll hit enter again. This one's more recent and I absolutely adore it. Um, so this was 2020 and most people now know the Great British Bake Off. It's all over the world now. And in the spirit of the Bake Off, the National Museum of Scotland held their own Bake Off. They asked their staff to create showstoppers. One person made the Lewis Queen out of dough. Um, and as you see, someone comically in their social media department has put chess faces on the judges and presenters. I honestly, this is one of my favorite so far for chessmen I found. And if you'll hit enter one more time, we'll do the last one on this page. This was a holiday one, I believe it was 2020 last year, and their happy holidays for the museum was, of course, the chessmen decorated in their kit for the holidays. Um, so I just want to warn you really quickly about the next slide before we go to it. It's really um, image full. And I do it for a reason, just to present it to you all at once instead of having to hit enter, 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 enter. Um, and it's not to overwhelm, but it's basically to give an idea of the sheer volume of posts. It's actually about Instagram. Um, so it's posts about the chessmen on Instagram. So if you'll go ahead and hit enter. There we go. So this is only a smattering of the things that I found. I honestly can't even tell you how many. I did a hashtag lookup of hashtag Lewis Chessman. I wanted to, and this was just in one day. You can actually see the timestamps on my phone as I'm taking screenshots or just one behind the other. Um, I kind of wanted to see what I could find with that hashtag on Instagram just to kind of see what people were using with that hashtag and in terms of their recognition of the chessmen. I was um, actually pretty surprised at how many there were. You know, I hearken back to the fact that I tell people do is chessmen and there's nothing. And yet you get thousands and thousands of hits all over social media. You even get a chessman dressed up for Thanksgiving. Chessmen are British and Scottish not American, thought that was interesting. You have people's tattoo art, you have people's sketches and drawings, um, pixelated images, people making wax creations, using them to display their alcohol. I mean, you've got all kinds of things. Um, the second one at the top is called Braggy the Traveling Viking. He's a little chess piece that goes on adventures everywhere and they take pictures of him. Um, in different places. There's another gentleman I talked to who does this in, in Stornoway on, on, on Lewis. Um, so they're kind of, they're kind of everywhere. And this was just a few screenshots on one day. Um, you know, this was a couple years ago that I did all these. So I'm sure they've changed by now. Um, but again, it's just to kind of show the sheer volume of the hundreds and hundreds of, of things that they're actually in, in the culture that we look around. And to kind of um, conclude this, um, I want to go to the next one and you can just kind of put them all up at once if you'd like. And it's actually about games. So if you hit enter and then it should be one, two, and then two more. There we go. So um, first off, I found the first one by happenstance by looking on YouTube for other things related to Lewis Chessman and I came across across this one, it's called the Age of Empires 2. Apparently this is quite a beloved game known as one of the most beloved strategy games of all time, originally called Age of Empires back in 1997. In this um, reiteration, they have different volumes, age, you know, age of one, two, three, all different kinds. Um, but in this particular one, it is set in the Middle Ages and contains 
um, 13 civilizations that people can play within. One of them is the Viking civilization. This is where we find our chessmen. And from what I could find research-wise, and it was hard for me to find anything on this, um, they, they called their army the Berserks. Now you see there's a king in the bottom. It looks like kings and all kinds of pieces up top. Apparently the Berserks are a heavy infantry unit and they are armed with axes and shields and can regenerate your character's power. The one in the middle is actually one I used to play. I haven't played it in a while, but I was just playing it one night, maybe a year or two ago. And it's a game, it's a hidden object game. You find hidden, hidden objects in within certain scenes of the player. You go to different rooms and find things. Um, and of course, I just go into this room randomly, right in the center of the room are my chessmen, and I thought, what, what's going on here? So I had to take screenshots and couldn't believe my eyes, there are my chessmen in this game, never thought I'd see them. And the last one, actually, a friend sent me this one, and it's a game called Art Inc., where you can buy and sell art. And he, you know, the gentleman there is saying that's uh, one of the chess pieces, we need to repurchase it, it's pretty pricey. I'd say at 4.47 million. Don't know if that's dollars, pounds, whatever their monetary is. That's pretty pricey. Um, so you can clearly see it's a, it's a Lewis chess king there. Um, and that's kind of the end of my discussion of all the popular culture. I know it was a lot, but honestly, there's so much that you just it's just hard to, to keep your eyes off it. And if you want to go to the next screen, I'm just kind of going to tell you what's next for me. Um, so if you hit just once. Now that I'm in North America, things have kind of recentered for me back here. So now I'm interested on um, Scottish collections that are in origin or theme that are here in North America. And if you'll hit number two for me. I'm interested to speak to people here in North America who may define themselves as Scottish in heritage, culture, ancestry. Like you said, your colleague is actually Scottish. Um, but for me, I'm interested to find out what people make, use, collect, or preserve that might remind them of home. And I say home in quotation marks as in Scotland, maybe not their original home, but maybe their ancestral home. Um, so I'm interested to speak to people and see what's important to them that reminds them of their heritage. And if you want to hit number three, if anyone wants to help out, I'm going to give you my contact details. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, if this applies to you and you're willing to help girl out with more research, I definitely would appreciate it. Other than that, if you want to hit the next screen, that is me all finished with my presentation. Finally. Well, thank you, Dr. Carter. <laughs> Dr. Carter. <laughs> well, it, it, it's, an, it's incredible where, where they're at and how much there is of them and uh, who knew? I mean, yeah. you knew, but we didn't know, but now we know a little bit of what you know, just the yeah, uh, very that was one edge. <laughs> yeah. That was yeah. one chapter, so there's so yeah. much. Um, you know, I tried to do the, the brief history at the beginning just to give a little bit of context because most people don't have any clue about them. Um, you know, and you're both museum people and I'm, maybe Tori has heard of them maybe through class or something, but had you ever heard of them before, Tom? No, I had not. I mean, we've watched Harry Potter a kajillion times, all of the different yeah, ones, but, yeah. but now I'll have them in a different light. <laughs> at yeah, least definitely. the Sorcerer's Stone. Yeah. And it's pretty interesting because at the end they play Wizard's Chess again, but it's the lot of these large pieces and they're not the Lewis Chessmen. So everybody's yes. right. That's the Lewis Chessmen. When they're trying to get past right. the, yeah. It's at the beginning, it's completely different. So, but most people recognize when I say the queen gets up and smashes, they're like, yeah, I remember that. So, yeah. um, just it's, it's, they're interesting. I didn't start out wanting to do specifically them, but I just kind of went down a rabbit hole and I thought I'm never going to have enough words to do my thesis. I had over my word count for my thesis because <laughs> there's so much. And yeah. so I did. Did my did my best to sorry the presentation so long but I just kind of wanted to give you a little bit of a sneak peek and maybe now you'll start seeing them in popular culture yourself and if you do send me an email well, I want to know. <laughs> I don't know if you could see me or not but I was only squirming because my chair I didn't take a very comfortable chair for the, <laughs> I've got to get the padded chair not the wooden chair. <laughs> Yeah, I, I sent Tori an email. I was like, Tori, it's kind of long. I'm sorry. There's a lot to talk about. And I cut out so, a few things as much as I could, too. So I apologize for the length. But hopefully it was a bit entertaining to learn a little bit more about something different. Yeah, for yeah. sure. For sure. And, uh, 
Uh, so we usually wrap up rather casually, but, but we want to invite everybody to come visit us in person at the Evansville Museum. Uh, things are opening up. We're feeling good. Uh, lots of vaccinations. And, and so mm -hmm. that's great. So at 411 Southeast Riverside Drive in Evansville, Indiana, Fridays and Saturdays from 11 to 5 p.m. and Sundays from 12 to 5 p.m. We're wanting visitors. We're hoping you come visit us and, uh, and visit us for our online presence. We have this fabulous presentation and others that are past and present and, and, and upcoming. Tori, you want to take us the rest of the way out? Well, Dr. Carter, I appreciate your time and thank you for teaching us all about this because I was just like, oh, more stuff, yes. Because <laughs> I, I did so much. Mm -hmm. I want to see somebody go on Instagram and start doing hashtag. I want to see what you find. It's unbelievable when you start looking. So yeah. it's just, I mean, you know, it's obviously it's fascinating to me, but I like to share it with other people. And, you know, it's interesting to learn about other things, I think. So That's it might right. be something new. You start watching a fun film and be like, there are those creatures she talked about again. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? Well, thank you so much. so much. You're, You're welcome, welcome, guys. Take care. Thank you for Bye. having me. Bye-bye.